All right, well, we got a lot to knock out today as we kick off this brand new series called Wild and Captivating. So week one, we're going to talk about the heart. Right now, everybody touch your heart. Everybody touch your heart. This is where it starts. We're going to be looking at a text in Proverbs that above all else, we want to guard our heart because from it flows the springs of life. And so as we jump into this new series called Wild and captivating. I want to read from Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 through 27 together. It says right here, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, right? So this is God uh, speaking to his Trinitarian nature, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, okay? So he's saying, this is the creation story, let's make man in our image. And then he says, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, So verse 27 says this, So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female. Let's say that together. Male and female. We're going to talk about male and female in this series the unique, beautiful creation from God. Male and female, he created them. As I shared with you, we're going to be journeying men through the book Wild at Heart. And uh, I have been on my own journey. I actually read this book years ago. It's been out for a couple decades now and Millions upon millions of copies have been sold. It's been translated in languages all over the world. It's been a powerful book. But uh, John Eldridge, who is the author of this book, uh, kind of, and I believe it was kind of because of what's been going on in our world today, where you have so many people searching, so many people hurting, especially with a pandemic that's worldwide and doing soul searching. Uh, they've kind of updated a lot of their resources, one of which we're going to be walking together through in our V groups each and every week. And so I'm so thankful for this book, Men Wild at Heart. Well, after years of having this book, um, John really started to pray that he would be able to create something of a resource also for women, um, also going into biblical womanhood and who God has created women to be. And his wife stepped up to the plate. And her name is Stacy Eldridge. And Stacy and John wrote together this book, Captivating. Um, I've already heard from some people in our church, they're like, I've read that three or four times. It's so good. And ladies, I'm just going to tell you, there's going to be some incredible gold in this book. Both of these books are available for you here. Um, We're going to be walking and reading through these books. So just go ahead and write this down. This week, as we get ready for our V group, we want to read chapters one and chapters two of both of these books and kind of read that hopefully before. Don't freak out. If you don't read it before, you can show up at our V groups. We got a video. It's going to be very easy for anybody to follow at any time. But we really believe in what's going on. I love how these books kick off. Both of these books kick off with a focus upon the heart. Now, let me ask you a simple question. What makes you come alive? Typically, when I find somebody uh, passionate about something or uh, when I find someone not passionate about something, um, it's not about the external things. It's about a matter of the heart, right? And, And I love that the focus in this series kicks off with a focus upon the heart because as it says in Proverbs, above all else, guard your heart because from it flows the springs of life. For most of us, whether we're up or whether we're down, it's really an issue of the heart. I want you to know I've been on my own journey over the last year. 
Uh, we've gone through quite a lot as a church. Uh, recently, my family relocated to Pittsburgh, called by God to come and join the fun up here in the Berg, uh, to come and start a new church. And that one vision of starting one church turned into a very quick inheritance of a couple different churches on top of the responsibility of leading a ton of churches all across the city, and I was honored to step into it. And things were rolling for us, and we were going, and man, I'll just tell you, check out this picture behind me. I mean, this was a picture of me preaching right here on this stage, right after our grand opening. We had 350, 400 people packed in this room. I mean, things were clicking on all cylinders. I could see everybody every week. I kind of knew the direction we were going. I had more staff than I knew what to do with. And then I don't know if y'all have heard, there was this thing called covid I hope y'all heard that there was this thing called COVID. And and it kind of shut everything down, right? And I found out very quickly when we answer this question, what drives you or what makes you come alive, that, man, there were some things in my life, like standing up on a stage each and every week and getting to use the gifts that God has given me to preach and inspire, Um, like sitting in a room with my peers, my brothers and sisters in Christ and, and learning how to strategize and, man, can we pray about planting a church here and why don't we do this and why don't we try and help these people there and why don't we try to, I, I quickly found out that being stuck at my house, in my living room, on Zoom, Zoom's a bad word now. Hate Zoom. <laughs> Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. I was like, man, I, I thought I had meetings before COVID, but now everybody's got their say, oh, you can get on this meeting. Let's book another meeting. See you on Zoom in 15 minutes. No, I'm in my pajamas. That's okay. Just join me for Zoom. So we got on Zoom, and I found real quickly that, man, I was starting to lose my soul. For our church specifically, some good. Some not so good. We started to see a COVID cleanse. We started to see people called to different places. Even some of my staff feeling called to go to different places. And we started to see some of our church begin to disappear, even on online engagement. And I found out real quickly that, man, there's a lot that helps me to come alive as a person that's no longer there. And if I can just tell you, as I was coming towards the end of the year, I I don't know, I've never really gone to counseling. I probably need it. Y'all probably should chip in to pay for counseling for me. It probably helped me to be your pastor. I'm just keeping it real. But I think I went through depression as we closed last year. We decided to come back after about 22 weeks. And when we came back, all of a sudden I looked up and it was a quarter of the congregation I had when we started this journey. And then, I don't know if you remember, we tried to come back, and then COVID spread throughout our congregation, shutting us down again. And I found myself over Christmas really, really depressed. I'll never forget. I'm at home. My parents come up for a visit to Pittsburgh around Christmas. And my dad and I go on this long walk together, and I've got some friends here, the Tooties. Uh, I love their dad, Bob Tootie. Reminds me a lot of my dad. It's like you get a lot of like love, but you get a lot of punches in the gut. And my dad knows the balance. And, and my dad takes me on this walk, and after being with us for a couple of days, he goes, you know what, Rob? I, I don't know exactly what God's been doing in your life, all the particulars, but I know you've been struggling, son, And if I could just tell you, one of the things that I think God intended for you in this COVID season was for you to be home more than you've ever been in your life. Because as a result of that, I want you to know what I'm observing from my grandkids is the benefit of having their dad home for a lot in this season. Look at this second picture. Here's my kids. They're sitting in a living room. I don't know what we're playing, sorry or Shoots and ladders, something. There's my four kids, and we're hanging out in the living room. And God began to speak to me. Maybe my aim was in the wrong place. What, what makes me come alive 
what, what really goes after my heart? Am I really after crowds? Am I after career positions? And you might be like, Rob, we'd kind of like you to love being a pastor. And I still do. But God started to minister to my heart, and it was around this time that someone recommended to me to read Wild at Heart again. And I started to read these pages, and I'll be honest, the first time I reread it, I think I've read it three times since, and I listened to it this past week on audio all the way through in one day. But I read this book, and what began to speak to me was a matter of the heart, because I started to find out that there's something deeper to life. There's something more meaningful than anything else in life. And God started to show me the beauty, the adventure, the battle of these three little kings and one future queen. You see, the current king and queen, we took a trip together. I'll show you this next picture. We went to Maine, and here we are on top of Cadillac Mountain in Maine, right near Bar Harbor, Bahaba. And, and we're at Bar Harbor, and we're overlooking this beautiful place, and uh, we went with the Smiths. We just kind of got out of town, and some great people watched our kids, and Annabeth and I started to answer questions for ourselves. What drives us? All right, God's limited some things here. God's taken away some things here. God's challenged us in some ways here. What's most important to you, Annabeth? Her saying to me, what's most important to you, Rob? And, and I want you to know, post that trip, I started to get reinvigorated with the outdoors. Now, men, can, can we just admit something real quickly? And this is why... After this week, I'm going to invite Annabeth to join me on stage. I don't plan on preaching to you ladies uh, about what it means to be a lady. I ain't one. So at certain levels, I'm going to be speaking to the men from personal experience. Um, that might actually protect me because I think if I get a little too preachy to you ladies, some of you ladies might leave. But Annabeth's going to come up and kind of balance out some of the things that I've been sharing from a women's perspective on things. But in regards to a man, for me, I don't know, maybe it was the quarantine, being cooped up and being held out. But there's just something to me about getting outdoors. And there's something to me about a challenge outdoors. And I've never been an outdoorsy person. I'm telling you, I've never been. I don't even know what to do with tools. I barely know how to flush a toilet. I mean, I'm just not a handy outdoorsman her, 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 type of guy. I was a gym rat my whole life, played basketball nonstop. That's all I cared about. I just lived in a basketball gym. And my friends would go mudslinging and hunting. I said, I got to practice hoops. You know, there's no way I'm doing that. But something within me started to rise up. And check out this scene. This was this past week. And as I'm praying about this series and getting going, I told the family, I said, I'm canceling all my plans, canceling all my meetings. We're going and we're hitting the woods. And so me and the kiddos go out and I go by Walmart and I buy the cheapest fly rod I can find because I'm like, there ain't no way any of our kids, you guys have seen some of my pictures of the last few weeks, I've fallen in love with fly fishing. And I absolutely love the adventure of it. I used to hate fishing because most of my fishing experiences was sitting and I can sit anywhere. I typically was probably not a good fisherman. That's why I was sitting a lot. But I like fly fishing because even if you don't catch anything, you're enjoying a hike. You're enjoying some scenery. There's always action or whatever else. But your pastor's getting pretty good, I'll be honest. And so I'm starting to reel in some fish. And so I bought this kind of like cheap fly rod from, from uh, Walmart. And we go out. And this was actually the first fish that I caught. And I noticed something in my oldest son's eye. He just had like a spark. He was checking this fish out, and it was so amazing. And I want to encourage you to go check out on Instagram. I didn't have time to post all this or show you all this, but um, he ends up picking up the cheap fly rod. And like a man obsessed, starts working on his cast even starts asking his daddy about techniques, which is a win 
nonetheless. I mean, that's just the fact that he's asking me for advice. This is already a great thing, right? Bolt's a know-it-all. He already knows what to do about everything. And here he's working on his cast, and he's working these, you know, different pockets of water. And, and we have a nice little fire by the stream, and we're just enjoying this family time together because I've started to answer questions of the heart. What matters most to me? And I'm soaking up all that life has. And here's Bolt. He's casting. He's casting. The, it's getting dark. I mean, we can't even see where Bolt is. And all of a sudden, I hear, fish on! And I'm telling you, our whole family jumped up. Mom couldn't figure out how to turn on the camera. I mean, our picture that we actually got is, Bolt looks possessed. I mean, it, it looks terrible. But nonetheless, we've got actual proof. Bolt caught the largest fish of the day. <laughs> I want to speak about what matters most. And as I shared on my Instagram posts, guys, that's not about the battle of a fish. It's not about the adventure of fishing. It's not even about the beauty of the fish that we caught. This is at the core. This journey of wild and captivating is all about the very essence of what it means to love God and to live free in who God created you to be. And if we can be honest, once you leave these doors, church family that's watching online right now, Memorial Day weekend, hope it's sunny where you're at. Once you leave this time where we're worshiping together, immediately you're going to be hit with a bunch of temptation, a bunch of theories, a bunch of theologies that are telling you to do anything but Love God and live free. I pray that these six, six, next six weeks would be weeks where you tap into what matters most. Now, here's a summary of what we're going to discuss together as men and as women. Behind me on the screen, you'll find a bunch of points that are discussed in both of these books. Number one, gender is from God. Contrary to popular opinion, to whatever society is leaning towards, I want you to know that gender is beautifully created from God. Male and female, he created us as we read in Genesis chapter 1. And I want you to know that you were uniquely made in his image. Notice in the text it didn't just say men. No, you were uniquely created in the image of God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit as man and woman. Number three, masculinity and femininity is deep and immortal and everlasting. Um, to every woman in the house, notice I'm reading here, to every woman in the house, um, Stacy Eldridge would say this, your feminine heart has been created with the greatest of all possible dignities. As a reflection of God's own heart, you are a woman to your soul, to the very core of your being. What you're going to unpack together, you talk about what drives you as a woman. She says, she says this, every woman longs to be romanced to play an irreplaceable role in a heroic adventure and to unveil beauty. To every man, John Eldridge would challenge us in this way, your masculine heart has been created with all the greatness, with the greatest of all possible dignities as a reflection of God's own heart. You're a man to your soul, to the very core of your being. So every man's heart has three core desires. Remember when I told you I was in this crisis personally? This book began to speak to me about what mattered most. That there's a battle to fight, an adventure to live, and a beauty to love. So let me break down some points as an intro to this journey together. Number one is this. First thing we need to do, church, is recognize the origin of life. 
Let's look at it again. Genesis chapter 1, 26 through 27. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image and in the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. I want you to know that it was God's design to create man as male and female. Now, the next slide up on the screen here is an infographic from an equipped teaching from the church that I planted back in 2008 in New Orleans. My longtime discipleship slash uh, equipping pastor, his name is Dr. Dustin Turner. He's like a walking commentary, okay, for the Bible. Brilliant man, one of my best friends in all the world. He did a four or five session long equip session on what it means to be human. We've posted this on our sermon resource page for you to go. And if you want to go deeper into this, each one of the teachings is about an hour and a half long. You're going to swim in some deep waters, okay? But he provides an infographic with a number of summary things about what it means to be human. I want you to check it out. Dr. Dustin is now the lead pastor of the church that I planted in New Orleans, and I love our church family so much down in New Orleans. But here's a graphic. Let me just read through the different things here. Created male and female, we are equal in value. God created humanity in two genders, male and female. Men and women are created, equally created, in the image of God. Gender demonstrates that humans were created for relationship, marriage, monogamous, heterosexual union, and then singleness, not above or below marriage. But we were created male and female equal in value, but not equal in function, different in function. Men and women were created equally valuable, as it's restating there. But secondly, men and women were created with complementary roles. We're going to unpack this more as we get into this series together. Here's the implications. Only two genders exist. Both men and women should be treated with value and equality. Marriage is only between a male and a female. And fourthly, God created men and women for complementary roles. Contrary to public opinion, I'm not interested. What does God's word say? And that is what God's word says in accordance with scriptures about what it means to be male and female. The first thing we're going to do in this series is recognize the origin of life. Number two, though, we're going to receive the creator of life. We're going to receive the creator of life. Proverbs 3, 5 says this, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. At the end of the day, as we take this journey over the next six weeks, I'm not interested in what your political party says. I'm not interested in what mama says. I'm not interested in what you say. What does the word of God say? And as we unpack this together and we ask for God's word to minister to us, to speak to us, I'm asking for the Lord to do something supernatural in us. Do you know that every single day when we get ready to worship Jesus together on a Sunday, we do a number of external things. We make sure the carpet's vacuumed, especially after the kids have been in here. We make sure that the chairs are in the right place. If you notice, I changed the chair configurations for the summer a little bit. I have an OCD issue that I need counseling for about chair configurations. But if you move a chair, the Holy Spirit's going to leave this room. I'm just letting you know. Um, We have a team out there that wants to greet you and say hello and make sure that your kids are taken care of. We want to make sure that you have next steps. All these things are external things. But do you know what I pray for every Sunday? I pray that hearts are changed. I can dial up the best worship service. I can preach the best sermon. We can make you feel as comfortable as possible. But at the end of the day, I cannot change your heart. Only God can do that. And so in this journey, we need to recognize the origin of life, but we most certainly need to receive the creator of 
life. So today I want to invite you, will you trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior? He loves you so much. If you're worshiping with us online right now, if you have any hopes of connecting your heart with the original plan for your heart to reflect God's heart, you first have to invite Jesus to come into your life and change your heart. And that is done by grace through faith in Christ alone. Receive the creator of life. But then number three, romanticize the battles of life. Romanticize the battles of life. Remember those three things that these books bring out? The first thing being that every woman longs to be romanced. And secondly, that every man wants a battle to fight. I've kind of combined those two things here. We need to romanticize the battles of life. Proverbs 4, 23, I've quoted this a couple times. Keep your heart, or above all, guard your heart with all vigilance, for from it flow the springs of life. In regards to men, I want us to recognize, and we're going to start to unpack this together, that healthy aggression is part of the masculine design. We are hardwired for it, John Eldridge says. He says, if we believe that a man is made in the image of God, then we would do well to remember that the Lord is a warrior. The Lord is his name, as it says in Exodus 15, 3. Now, ladies, we'll invite Annabeth to talk about romance. I feel like I've been able to do a little romance over the years of our marriage. I know how to sing boys to men when she wants me to sing it. She'll tell you that's not very romantic. I think it is. And we can talk about all those things, but I want to talk about the battles here. The funniest thing happened this past year, I'll never forget, uh, Jake and Allie Smith, they've got five kids. They've got four girls and one boy. The little boy's name is Josiah. This kid reminds me of the character Mowgli in Jungle Book. If you've met Josiah, uh, you know you met Josiah. I mean, this boy is wild, and I love it. I absolutely love it. I remember something went down with some parents or some kids or something like that. And we're having lunch together with the Smiths, with Jake and Allie, me and Annabeth. And Allie starts her, ain't nobody going to touch my son. And she starts moving her head like this. Man, nobody's going to do anything to my son. I'm just going to, I'm going to march down there and I'm going to deal with this. And I said, no! The best thing in Josiah's life would be to get beat up. He does not need his mama to come in and protect him. He needs a battle to fight. He has learned too quickly that I can throw things without consequences at my sister because they're scared of me. He needs a bully to straighten him out a little bit. And I'm not just talking about something physical. I'm talking about something deep-rooted here. And we laughed about it. And I'm not telling Allie not to show up. I'm not telling you, Mama, not to show up. But let your son battle some, fight some battles. My twins, man, they have fought their entire lives. And because of that, they can whoop any kid their age. It's just not even close. The battles, guys, are not something that is something that is so superficial and aggressive. And this is about wars and, you know, all these other different things. No, this taps into the heart of manhood. And if we talk about these things, ladies, at the core, you really want a man who can win a battle. Not just a fist fight, but a battle over your family's soul. The grit that it takes to stand up in resistance when the whole world is telling your kids to do this. But you, as for you and your house, going to serve the Lord. I want us in this journey to romanticize the battles of life. Number two, rest in the adventure of life. Once again, in these books, for every woman, they want to play an irreplaceable role in a heroic adventure. Every man wants to live in an adventure. In Proverbs 16, 9, it says this, The heart of man plans his way, but the Lord establishes his 
steps. And as we found out in our previous series called The Ascent, is the Christian life boring? Absolutely not. And what is the Christian life? The Christian life is dying to ourselves, our plans. I got to do this this way. I got to have everything organized. If I can just be real, Annabeth got a little taste of how our family rolls. My brother had to work a summer job while we were dating in high school, and uh, she got invited to join my family. Uh, I don't remember how long. I think it was like a month or two months long trip to Europe. She found out real quickly. Her family, I'm just telling you, like they're going to the beach this summer. They planned that back in 1982. That's how much her family plans. My parents took us, my little sister, 10 years younger than me, Annabeth, myself, and my two parents, and the only things my parents had rented or planned beforehand was the flight and the rental car. Every single day in Germany, in Belgium, in France, in Italy, we winged it. We took an adventure. Now, I don't recommend that for everybody, and actually, since we've been married for 17 years, I actually enjoy planning. I get more irritated with my family. But at the core, what does that Proverbs verse say? The heart of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. One of my hopes for us in this journey as men and as women is that we would die to our own adventure or thought of adventure, and we would surrender to his ways for our lives. And I promise you, when you tap into that truly in who God created you to be, hold on. It's going to be an amazing ride the kind of things that make life click and go to the next level in all things. But number three, reach for the beauty of life. And the last point, reach for the beauty of life. Every woman wants to unveil beauty. Every man wants a beauty to love. Every man wants a beauty to love. In Jeremiah 29 Verse 13, it says this, You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In these first couple chapters in the Wild at Heart book, John talks about his son. He talks about his son playing baseball. He said his son, you know, was pretty interested in baseball, but he was most interested in the neighbor's daughter down the street. And one day, the neighbor's daughter showed up right as he was about to step up to the plate and said, hey. He said, my son acted like a peacock, got wide in his stance, acted like he ignored her, but he fully knew she was there, and he cranked one out of the park. There's something within us of the little girl that wants to unveil beauty and the little boy that wants beauty. There's something within us, male and female, that's so gorgeous, that's so beautiful, that's in this world that's so gorgeous and so beautiful. And what I pray is that we within our hearts, as it says in Jeremiah 29, 13, that you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I pray that all of our passions and all of our desires would pursue a love for God and everything that he created your world to be. I've got a prayer as we kick off this journey together, and I want this prayer to be a prayer that guides us through this series. It's found in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14 through 21, it says this, For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. And so I want you to underline verse 17. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Everybody say hearts. Dwell in your hearts. Through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love, once the Lord transforms your hearts, just think of the possibilities right now. 
Think of what God desires for you right now as we pray for this right now, that you may have the strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth And to know the love of God that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now, to him who is able. He's able. But Rob, most of my life has been a gender crisis. To him who is able. Rob, I'm in depression right now. To him who is able. Rob, I long for my spouse to tap into who they are. To he who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and forever, amen.